Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is New York Giants linebacker Mark Herzlick. <laughs> From an All-American linebacker at Boston College to a young man fighting for his life, battling an extremely rare form of cancer, to a Super Bowl champion with the New York Giants. It's been quite the ride for linebacker Mark Herzlick, and at the tender age of 27, that ride has only just begun. Herzlick is now preparing for his fifth season in the NFL, which at one time was thought to be absolutely impossible. It's an amazing story which he recently shared with an attentive audience at an event at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And we had the pleasure of sitting down with Mark to get even more in depth. The incredible Mark Herzlick is next on Sports Files. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, appreciate it. Really appreciate that. You know, right off the bat, why don't you show that Super Bowl ring to our camera there? There you Look go. at that. How, <laughs> how nice is that? That is one big piece of jewelry. Well, listen, it's great to have you in Memphis and have you here at St. Jude. Let me ask you, first of all, when you do these talks, what is your message? Well, I, it's different each time, but, but really what, what the, the point of it is, when I talk to the, the kids at, at a hospital like this, uh, it's to, to keep hope um, because so much of your day is filled with numbers and data and blood tests and chemotherapy and radiation that keep hope that you know your dreams are never dead and that's that's one of the things that I learned early is that people were telling me you'll never play football again and and you're never gonna run again and I still had this dream of playing and I was able to kind of look past the stats and all the doctor talk and the medical talk and right. say you know, I, I still got this dream and I want to keep pushing towards it and eventually was able to get there. I, that's what it is. But how were you able to do that? Were you leaning on your family? Were you leaning on other people? Because it's easier said than done. Well, you can't do it yourself. And, and I never believed that um, I could do it myself. I, I created this team, right? Before, from the very first day, it was a team comprised of my dad, my mom, my brother, mm -hmm. my teammates. And then we found, you know, the best doctors and nurses that we could find in our area and created this kind of community around my illness. And every time that all of a sudden I'd be swaying from the center of that community, someone would push me back in and someone would give me that helping hand that I needed. A support system. That's what you have. Exactly. All right, let's go back to B.C. After your junior year, could have went to the NFL. All of a sudden now you're diagnosed with this rare form of cancer. I mean, mm -hmm. you were strong, obviously as we just talked about, but your initial reaction, what was it like? Was it, why me? It, I was scared. And I remember sitting in on the, you know, the, the doctor's table with you know, a little piece of paper over top of it and just my hands starting to sweat and feeling like I was kind of just you know, falling. And that type of falling where you, know, you, you snap out of a dream and you wake up and like, oh, thank gosh, it was just a dream. Well, it wasn't just a dream. And this was a time where I had to realize that it was gonna be harder than things had been. It was going to be a road that I didn't know how to get down. And so I was uh, not only fearful for not being able to do the things I loved again, but fearful that I wouldn't you know, have a future. Right. It wasn't just football. Now it was a battle for your life. And there were many that thought you wouldn't survive. Mm -hmm. So you get to a point where you have to make a choice. Conventional way of treating this rare form of cancer, or something completely different, experimental. You go the experimental route, tell me why. I did, and th there was a decision that had to be made. And since it is such a rare disease, one of the bad things about that, there's not a lot of research around it. Right. You know, when, one, when one in a million people get this type of cancer, they don't spend the government funding for this type of research. And so you have to kind of piece together your decision based on the facts that you have. And the facts that I had were 
that, yeah, one is more commonly used. Yeah, they've had success with it, but it wouldn't give me the chance of living a complete life after cancer. And it was a lot of prayer. It was a lot of deliberation with that community that I created with my family. And it was a decision that ultimately came down to not how do I want to avoid dying, but how do I want to live my life? I would imagine battling this disease that's in your body a lot tougher than taking on a 250 pound fullback. <laughs> yeah, it is. On Sundays sometimes I'm like, man, that's pretty tough too. <laughs> but it's it's a different kind of strain. It's, it's, it's a mental strain. Obviously you're getting some physical um, degradation in your body through all the chemotherapy and, and medicine, but a lot of it is mental. A lot of it is spiritual and a lot of it's like, yeah, why am I even going back every day? If I'm just going to feel this bad all the time and I'm not going to see my results getting that much better, why am I doing this? And that why am I doing this thing is what we try to keep people away from. September 09, euphoria. You get the news, it's gone. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, that's why, that's why I was doing it. That's why I was sitting in the chair. You knew it would happen one day. And, and I, tr I believe that I'd be back on the field. I believe that I'd join my teammates again. I believe that I'd play football again when no one else believed that. And on September 4th, 2009, Weaver State came to Alumni Stadium at Boston College, and I was standing there in the tunnel, suited up with my pads on, ready to play again. And it was something that they said I'd never be able to do again. Um, and I ran out in the field, and was just like this elation. It was this kind of, uh, everything was coming together, all these mental images of myself doing this for the past year were finally coming to fruition. What was it like with your teammates, your coaches, the fans at BC when you got back there? Yeah, they were fantastic. My coaches stuck with me the whole time. I remember my one coach in particular, Bill McGovern, he was our linebacker coach and I was very close with them. And, he called me every day after training camp, and I was at home, and I was sitting there. I was, you know, getting done chemo, kind of tired, laying back. He goes, "Oh, Mark, you got you got to help me with these guys. I don't know how to get through to them. I don't know what to do." Um, and but it really it was cool because it kind of included me in what was going on. Um, and then my teammates were fantastic. They created a charity organization up there um, called Uplifting Athletes, where they did this big lift for life, where all the football players got on the football field and lifted weights and ran events to raise money for Ewing Sarcoma Research in particular. And they raised $30,000 in 20 days and all of it went directly to research to try to help cure this type of cancer. Did you know right away when you came back, got back on the football field, your life was, was getting back to some sort of normalcy, that you were gonna dedicate part of your life to coming and doing talks like you're doing today to trying to raise money for this dreaded disease? I didn't, when I was first diagnosed, I had no idea. When I was going through the process and, uh, you know, camera crews were in my, my chemo room and newspapers were there taking pictures, I didn't know. I just thought that, you know, they, they wanted a story. Right. But as things kind of progressed and, and as I got to that point where I was cancer free, I started receiving all these letters. I started getting an influx of people saying, tell me your story. I want to know more how you did this uh, because I want this for myself. And and so then it did, it became my goal. I feel like it became my purpose. And, and someone you know, a couple years ago came up to me and said, Mark, you know, you're a great, great football player and we're so happy for everything you've done in the ring and everything, but you know, God put you on this earth for a different purpose. Not to play football, mm -hmm. it, it's to help others. You're a better ambassador and sending that message and spreading that message. So the, the senior season, mm -hmm. as we said, after your junior year, you're getting the accolades around the country. People know who you are. You could have jumped to the NFL. You come back, you go through this. You battle this dreaded disease. The senior season, now you're getting ready for the draft, and it doesn't happen. Right. Do you believe that, well, first of all, mm -hmm. were you as good as you were before? And two, do you believe that teams stayed away because they thought, God forbid, it may come back? Well, I was not as good as I was before that senior year. Were you an NFL player? I was, uh, honestly, the beginning of the season, no. You watch the film in the beginning of the year, I was going, I was making some plays, but I was slow. I was, uh, my step slow. I wasn't as strong as I was. I had it in my brain, I had it instinctually, um, but I didn't have it on film. And that's, when, you, when you've been playing in the NFL for a while, you understand what's on film, that's your resume. Right. And as the season progressed, I got better and better. And I think towards the end of the year, yes, I think I was an NFL player. But yes, it did scare teams, and rightfully so. 
if there's a kid who you don't know if he's going to be healthy, are, are we going to spend money? Are we going to hire this guy to compete in an athletic comp competition when we don't know if he's going to be able to run or if his bone's going to break? And so, you know, I it's think a business. it is a business and it, it, it's it's an incredible business and it's an awesome business, but it's a business. And at the end of the day, you have to be able to help your team win. And a lot of teams felt, mm, man, I don't know, the risk might be greater than the reward. But what we've learned about you is you don't give up, you keep going strong, you don't get drafted, but now you sign a free agent deal with the Giants. Mm -hmm. You go out there to try to show you belong, you make the 53 man. You know, six years later, well, four <laughs> years later, now a new yeah. two-year deal, we're talking about you still playing linebacker in the NFL. So. Talk about the Giants giving you that shot, Coughlin, the whole Boston College yeah. connection. Well, I mean, it was it, it was something that I, I didn't get drafted. And this was the lockout year, so we we're just oh my gosh, you know, we're, we're not getting calls right away. There's still right. these big waiting periods, so the lockouts lifted uh, late in July, and and I get a phone call from Coach Coughlin, and he says, "Hey, Mark, what's going on? It's Tom Coughlin," and I'm like, "Guys, it's Tom Coughlin on the phone with me." <laughs> and he, co coach says, uh, you know, Mark, I know your story, and uh, obviously I followed you at BC, and I think it's an incredible story, and I'm very proud of you, but I don't want you to be on the Giants because of your story. I want you to be on the Giants because I think you can help us win a Super Bowl. And I was like, you know what, finally. Because so much of my, the talk had been about just cancer, about is he ever going to be good again? Is he ever right. going to be able to live up to what he was? Uh, and now there was someone who was saying, you know, I believe in you. And I think that you're going to be able to get back there, and I think you're going to help our team win. Uh, and so I went there. It was difficult to make the team. Uh, I remember I think I was like last on the depth chart for a while. And uh, and and you know, being able to make the team and going through that season and, and the crazy run that the Giants had, and to be able to be a part of that and to start that year as a as a rookie against the Philadelphia Eagles on on Sunday Night Football. I mean, that it was just a surreal feeling. And then it. Obviously, to be able to finish the season like we did was incredible. What was your welcome to the NFL moment? Well, I mean, the very first play. We were in Washington playing the Redskins on the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Wow. And there were fighter jets flying over the, the, the stadium and fireworks going off. And you know, the whole entire stadium singing the national anthem. I'm getting goosebumps. I'm like about to tear up. I'm like, this is awesome. And then I line up for kickoff and I run down the field and I run directly in between two 300 pound offensive guards running at me. Um, and uh, yeah, that, I think that was a uh, that was that was a welcome to the NFL moment. During the anthem, though, you're pinching yourself going, I cannot believe I'm here in the NFL. I, I, honestly, I kept looking down on my hand and looking at my helmet and seeing the NY and being like, you know, this, this is not just first of all, it's not just the NFL. This is tradition. This is history. This is. New York Giants versus the Washington Redskins. I mean, that, that to me was, was a, a really cool moment. And then you, you, you can't end your rookie season any better. Super Bowl, victory. Talk about that. Well, I mean, it, so we were out in Indianapolis, and, and it was just an, an, an awesome environment. You know, I had never been to a Super Bowl before, nonetheless played in a Super Bowl before. Um, and so, you know, we went out there, and... Um, you know, I, I actually I was injured at the for that game and just kind of annoyed that I couldn't suit up really. But I'm on the sidelines and I'm, and I'm watching the team. And you know, at the end of the game, Tom Brady throws that pass up there, a hail mary, and all of a sudden the, our guys knock it down and the confetti pours down and run down the field. And I mean, it was it was an awesome moment for me because I felt like things had kind of come full circle. But seeing my mom and my dad and my brother out on the field with me and having them come up and hold the Lombardi trophy with me, um, we had all come full circle and, and we had all kind of gotten through the pain and were able to walk on the other side. It wasn't just for you, it was for family, it was for friends, it was for everybody who supported you, going back to that support system we talked mm -hmm. about. And then you, as you said, you were injured, but your professional career moving along now, getting better and better, mm -hmm. getting starts, playing, playing very well. As we mentioned, you, you signed mm -hmm. the new two-year deal. Yeah. And things I mean, are going pretty well. The future's looking good. And I'm, I, I like to take one, things that, one thing at a time, one step at a time. But the fact that there are more steps possible, you know, that's inspiring to me. Because, um, you know, the, the longer I play, the better I get, the, the more people I'm able to help, the more I'm able to kind of uh, be happy with, with my play and that the, the more I'm able to uh, do for the community and so 
I love the Giants. Uh, I'm so happy I'm back for two more years, and uh, yeah, let's get another Super Bowl ring. And let me ask you about the, the book, what it takes. Um, fighting for my life and my love of the game came yeah. out uh, this past year. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's selling well. Yeah, no, it's doing great. So uh, I, I decided to write this book after uh, I read a bunch of different books, but you know, mostly Teddy Bruschi's book. Um, right. When I was going through my radiation treatment, and Teddy was, uh, had a stroke and he had a big hole in his heart and kind of fought through to play again. And, and that sort of fight and, and strive to get to where he wanted to go was inspiring to me. And people look all the time for someone who's done it before. And this was my way of saying, you know, I, I can't unfortunately write back to everyone. And this is my letter to everyone saying, this is what I did. This is how I did it. These are the people who did it with me and for me. You know, it wasn't me just doing it alone. And so that, that's what the book's about. And, and it's fun. And there's stuff about the NFL, the Super Bowl. But it's cool because it has been doing well. And the best, the best thing, no matter how many people have, have bought it and read it, uh, when I get people on Instagram or Twitter saying, you know, I, I gave this book to, to my brother who's fighting cancer, uh, and it completely changed his attitude. It wow. completely changed his outlook. Uh, th that's what it's about, and that's what it's for. And it's cool because you know, the paperback is coming out um, June 2nd, so it's right around the corner for, for another release of it. And, and the more people we're able to touch, the better. Absolutely. Mark, we like to end all our interviews with something we call Five for the Road. Mm -hmm. Find out a little bit more about you. Just first thing that comes to mind. This is going to be interesting because the first question is your favorite professional sports team, but I cannot allow you to say the New York Giants. So, who uh, would it be? Okay, I'll, I'll say the uh, New York Yankees. The Yankees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Favorite professional athlete of all time? Oh, boy. Um, Lawrence Taylor. LT. How about your favorite music or group or, or singer? Who do you, what do you listen to? James Taylor. JT? <laughs> oh, James Taylor. You don't, you don't listen to JT before a game. He's not going to fire you up. No. Uh -uh, but you got, that's like 16 weeks a year you got to listen to whatever <laughs> that is. So you got to listen to James Taylor all the time. Favorite movie of all time? Uh, Fight Club. And your favorite television show of all time? Oof. The Sopranos. The Sopranos. It's yeah. a good one. That's that New Jersey that, thing. Hey, I'm in North Jersey now, too. So. <laughs> and I'm a South Jersey guy. Yeah. Mark, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you again for coming to Memphis and to St. Jude. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. We'll take a quick break. Overtime is coming up next. Rob Weatherly is the facilities coordinator and head speed and strength coach at D1 Sports Training in Collierville. The Murray State graduate has been training athletes, young and old, for 15 years now and is back in the Memphis area after working two years with the St. Louis Cardinals. D1 became a training staple in Memphis in late December of 2014, and now it's become one of the standards in the industry. Many athletes have come through the D1 doors to get healthy, perform better, and maximize their ability. Well, Rob, tell me a little bit about D1. Sure. D1 is a sport performance training facility really built on helping athletes achieve their maximal potential in athletics. We start as age seven and actually go all the way through elementary school, middle school, high school, and then beyond. So we really try to teach the sport performance movements of speed, power, agility, reaction, and quickness and do that kind of in a semi-private training group environment so that the coaches can teach each athlete how to maximize their potential and improve in their sport. Well, an athlete, let's say a collegiate athlete who is training, undergraduate, still at school, also work out at D1? Or is this after they're done their careers or before they start? Well, it kind of depends. Obviously, collegiate athletes have strength and conditioning staff at their university, but spring break or during the summertime, collegiate athletes will come to us and kind of get that extra, you know, benefit of what we can help them with in a small group training environment when they're in their normal you know, team, they have maybe 80 guys in there. And sometimes it's a little tough to kind of get the individualization that we can really provide for them. So, you know, athletes come to us all the time just trying to get a little bit better. D1 is coupled with ortho one. So during workouts, uh, something happens or coming in, may have some type of an injury. 
you have the facilities right here in Collierville to take care of that as well. We do, yeah. Ortho One, it's a unique environment. Uh, our physical therapy staff here is able to check out athletes when we evaluate all of our new athletes, especially at a collegiate and or professional level. They can kind of get that attention to detail for any old injury that they've had to make sure that they're cleared to move forward at 100%. You've been in the business for 15 years. You're a graduate of Murray State. But it's not your first stint in Memphis, in the Memphis area. You're back for a second time. That's correct, yes. I, I moved here in 2004 to help an advanced speed and performance facility uh, and actually had a good relationship with a lot of University of Memphis football players now. And uh, went away for a little while but came back, and, and now I'm here serving the community, and I'm happy to be back. Last couple of years, though, very unique. You worked for the St. Louis Cardinals organization down in Jupiter, Florida. Tell us about that. Uh, that I did. Yeah, it was a unique uh, environment. Uh, I had some good relationships that I met when I moved to St. Louis uh, and actually was uh, a part of the strength and conditioning staff uh, within the St. Louis Cardinals baseball organization. So it was a part of their advanced high-A affiliate team uh, and was able to obviously report for uh, Major League Spring Training and help out all the guys there. So it's a pretty unique uh, opportunity. You mentioned that you start kids as young as seven. When is it proper for kids, or is it proper, to start lifting weights? Sure. Well, you know, we think of, from a strength and conditioning community, not just lifting weights, but strength training. And strength training can really start with just body weight movements. Obviously, using medicine balls are very light resistant, so it's kind of interdependent. Uh, athletes can start doing basic strength training even as early as age seven. That's when we start, but it's not really overload training. So when some people think of strength training, they obviously think of what it's like maybe at a collegiate level or an adult level, but we're starting at a very base level of laying that foundation of proper movement patterns correctly first, mm -hmm. and then just stimulating them with basic uh, resistance moving forward. You just look around here at the athletes at D1, and you see a lot of stretching and warming up going on before they, they work out. How pivotal is that? Well, that's the, the biggest part of training is preparing an athlete for an event that they're getting ready to do. Preparation, just like anything really in life, the better you become at preparing yourself, the more effective your actual training is going to be. So anybody can really do training or do the work, but we want to get them prepared and stimulated for that particular event so they can obviously do that uh, you know, with any lack of injury. What about athletes that are also concerned with, with diet, which is a part of getting stronger, getting faster. It's also what you eat. I, I know that's not exactly what you guys are doing here, but do you have advice for, for, for some of these athletes that may ask you about it, or do you – do you send them in another direction where they can get that information? The biggest part from me, obviously being a strength and conditioning coach, nutrition is a part of that link, and we think of it as education. So every time that we speak with any athlete about nutrition, we want to find out what their education level is. Do they know how many calories that they're taking in for a particular day? What does their particular diet catalog look like over a block of two days or a week? What are they taking in? So we kind of look at what they're missing what they might be getting maybe too much of, and then come up with a general diet plan moving forward. Some of our viewers may remember Will Bartholomew, who was a former Tennessee volunteer. He started D1 in Nashville. He's the president of the company, and there's a number of D1s now around the area. Why is it so popular when you obviously have a lot of choices in this field? What is it about D1 that makes it so special? Well, D1 is special because obviously our facility is number one. I mean, we are bar none, probably the nicest training facility here, but it all comes back to coaches. Obviously, I try to staff my facility with extremely certified strength and conditioning coaches who have been around and helped athletes, and that's what we're here to do. People that are passionate about this field and obviously passionate about helping others. You can have a good strength and conditioning coach, but if they're just so hard that they can't you know, touch and reach a, a juvenile scholastic kid, then that's not the kid for this job. But we love coaches that love kids and love helping others, and that's what we're all about. Right, not sure if there's some type of confidentiality thing you have to sign when you're here, but I was just wondering some of the names that you have trained over the years, some of the bigger names, some of the pro athletes. Well, obviously being in the St. Louis area and Memphis area, I've, I've had quite a few athletes to work with, and I, I don't care. Don't I don't, I don't, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> if people – are interested in, in getting your help, getting the help of the, of the fine folks that work here at D1, what do they need to do? The best thing to do is just go to the D1 website, which is d1sportstraining.com, uh, backslash in Memphis, and just check us out, and really that will put you in the right direction to uh, getting in the building. Hey, Rob, continued success. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate it very much. All right. And our thanks to Rob. Well, the NBA second season is underway, and the Grizzlies came roaring out of the gate Sunday night, 
routing the Portland Trail Blazers 100 to 86 in the opening game of their best of seven first round series. Marcus Saul went for 15 points, 11 rebounds and seven assists and coupled with Zach Randolph for 31 points and 22 boards combined. The Grizz also got a huge lift from the return of Mike Conley and Tony Allen. Conley scored 16 points in 24 minutes. But the hero for the good guys was reserve Benno Udry, who scored a career high 20 points while adding seven rebounds and seven helpers. Now, since the Grizz played game two last night after we taped our program earlier in the day, we have no idea what the result was. Obviously, we hope it's a 2-0 Grizz lead as they head to Portland for game three Saturday and game four on Monday night. We'll have much more on the Grizzlies next week. Also, the River Kings were swept to love in the Southern Professional Hockey League President's Cup Finals, falling to Knoxville. Now, despite the defeat, it was a great run for the Kings. As always, you can see any of our previous Sports Files shows by heading to our website, WKNO.org. And that'll do it for now. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.